Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai haere mai. Greetings everyone and welcome to our latest podcast show for NZ Free Law, brought to you by ture.co.nz. And the purpose of the podcast is to assist with fulfilling Ture's mission, which is to connect New Zealanders with better access to and knowledge of legal services. So the NZ Free Law podcast talks all things law in New Zealand. It's for everyone, the public and legal practitioners, about things like frequently asked questions that lawyers get asked and try to answer those the best we can. Also legal theory, cases and uh, hot legal industry topics, what's happening in the industry and also its future. We've got a great guest on the show today and I'll introduce you to our guest soon. But first, I'll introduce you to my co-host, Josh. Curious, Josh. I'm the dum-dum. When the lawyers are talking too sophisticated, I say, wait, I don't understand what you're, what you're talking about. Explain it to me more simply. Great. Great to have you here again, Josh. Um, as a non-legal person, your views and questions are really helpful. My name's Julia Stenson and I'm a lawyer from the Waikato who's moving into a new digital space as the founder of ture.co.nz and NZ Free Law. So now to our special guest of the day, Sue Tappenden, who for many years was a law lecturer both here in New Zealand and in the UK, but is now living the good life, the good retired life in the Bay of Plenty. Now Sue was my lecturer at law school. And, but for the benefit of the audience, Sue, can you can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Good morning. Good morning. Well, I was born in England. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents in a sleepy little town in Norfolk. Um, and I was let loose on all of their books. And most of them were very dusty tombs about Greece and Rome and the Shakespeare novels. Uh, it was wonderful. The plays, everything was just wonderful. Um, and then about 10 years old, I ended up in a school in London with 40 other children. And when I went to write things, the uh, the teachers realised that my spelling was largely Old English because I'd <laughs> learned from the Shakespeare plays. <laughs> so I was an odd kid. <laughs> but my, my love of um, philosophy started there. And then we came to New Zealand for a visit in uh, 1972 and um, we stayed for seven years that time and I got a place at Victoria University Wellington I came away from that thinking yes I want to be a lawyer and then my husband got posted to Hong Kong <laughs> and that wasn't very helpful to my career <laughs> we had to give up our home there and we ended up in England I went back into full-time education. I got an honours degree in law at that time. So that, that was me, really. Let's jump into the, the topic of the day, and it is based around the theory of law today. And we're looking, so the legal word is equity. Now, my understanding, thanks to you, Sue, from law school, <laughs> is that it's a branch of English law originally that was developed hundreds of years ago. And it was around when litigants would go to the king and complain of the harsh, inflexible rules of the common law, which which prevented this kind of justice or equity from prevailing. And so the king would adjust it accordingly and out popped this, this idea of equity. Like fairness. That, that's right. That's right. A lot of people do equate equity with fairness. You say hundreds of years. In actual fact, it was thousands of years because... The idea of equity began with the Greeks, but it seems like every time a society gets to the stage where they've got laws, they've got lawmakers, they've got adjudicators, judges, and they've got people who will administer the law, like police, as soon as that develops, there arises this need for something else, which we call equity. So the Greeks had it, and it was in essential to the way the law worked. Equity came before everything. And then, of course, when the Romans overtook the Greek civilization, they adopted a lot, and that was one of the things they adopted. And, of course, when Rome fell and the barbarians um, you know, took over, equity was lost for a long, long while. But in England... 
very early on in the 11th century, even, yes, and a bit later, um, equity started to be revived through the church because the Roman Catholic religion had survived the fall of Rome and that had come to England. And so the church um, was very influential over the king. And so the idea was that the, the king was the epitome of all things fair. He was the, you know, he was the arbiter. He was one down from God in society. And so he could, um, he could refer to his, um, his mentor, his archbishops, and they would tell him what was right in, uh, in the way of equity to do. But as, I hate to say it, as the legal profession became more powerful in England, that aspect of law um, kind of petered out. And uh, so the king needed a new court to deal with all the problems that were coming up. And so, yes, as you say, people were going directly to the king. He couldn't deal with it all. And so eventually the court of equity with the chancellor, who was originally a religious person, he was uh, a man of God. He, he would deal with all the problems. And yeah, so it wasn't till 1873 that the two systems became uh, joined. But, but how does that, that's the history lesson, how does that apply or how do yes. you see that today? There's lots of different parts to, to equity law, right? So I, I yeah. wouldn't, that we can't obviously cover off in, in one podcast. So today we're really just wanting to focus in on the area of trusts in the law of equity, which is commonly used in New Zealand. So can you talk a little bit about how, as Josh has suggested, how does that apply, you know, how is that? come out? Trusts are the child of equity. You can't have trusts unless you have this split. And equity allows us to split ownership between legal, which is whoever's name is on the title, and equitable, whose money bought the goods. So if your money bought goods, but someone else's name is on the title, equitably, you, you own the goods even though someone else has them legally. So the law is now able, because the two have been joined, any court is now able to administer equity and say those goods should come to you and be put in your name if you so desire. So a trust is where you put goods into a person's name, who is the trustee, and they hold them for the benefit of someone else who's the beneficiary. Now, at that point, the settler should drop out the picture unless he names himself as a beneficiary as well. But you've got to be quite careful about that. Yes, so that's how it works. You can say you've got a son who is not very good at holding on to his money. You can take the money that you want him to have. You could put it into a trust. You could appoint people that you know and you trust and are honest as trustees, and they can look after and invest the money and give the proceeds of the investments to your son as you direct. So normally you have more than one normally you have more than one beneficiary. Um, so it might be the son and his children, and so you can pay for education and all that. But the settler then drops out; he doesn't have any more to do with it, or shouldn't. But quite often in New Zealand, that's not the case. There's many set up where the settler is... What's the settler? Who's the settler? He's the person. the person who owns the stuff to begin with, then puts it into the trust. He settles the money in trust. But in New Zealand, um, many, many accountants... Now, I'm sorry if you're an accountant. My mother is an accountant. I have nothing against accountants. But many, many accountants... Um, advise setting up a trust where the only beneficiary is in fact the settler or the settler and his family. And so the settler gets the idea that he can have all the protection against the tax man and against his own creditors because the money is in a trust, but he can still use it to buy cars, houses, anything he likes. Um, 
Is that it, not true? No, no, that's not <laughs> no, the way it's, and it's a built big to work. Problem mm. Because if you get caught doing that, you're liable for all the back taxes, and it, you're actually liable for fraud. Um, because what you're doing is defrauding the system. Um, how to explain it a bit better? Uh, there was an example where a man had a firm and he was sole trader and he had guaranteed some contracts. But before he signed the guarantee, he took some of his assets like his house and his cars and all his trucks and he put them into a trust. When the firm went under, he claimed that all these assets were in the trust, so they weren't available to be sold to pay his creditors. Now, that meant that a huge number of people who had trusted him, who had let him have goods on credit, were now being defrauded because he was saying, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm above all this. I've got all my money in trust. You can't touch it. Sorry. But the court stepped in and they said, no, because you've been buying and selling that house, you, you sold that first house, you bought another one for your own benefit, uh, the cars are for your benefit, not for anyone else's, you've been using the assets of the trust for your own benefit, therefore it's not a trust at all. And so the, the trust was just dissolved as non-existent and the creditors got what they were owed. So it's a good example of how not to do it. Yeah. And yet so many New Zealanders, I would imagine, are thinking that that's, that's fine and they, as you say, they've been advised. I guess the other one is, what's the difference between that trust and a company or a limited liability company? Um, a limited liability company is fine um, because you're actually up front. You're saying to creditors up front, that I have limitations on how liable I'm going to be. And then they they know the situation. And if they then give you goods on credit, then they are um, acting with full knowledge. But for people who are dealing with um, a man they see is having a big house and cars who don't know about this trust that he's set up, um, it, they, they don't understand the... <laughs> They don't understand how he doesn't want to be liable, even though he should. So limited liability is great. And it's a different branch of law, of course. It's, you know, ordinary commercial law. And that's one of the problems. When you get trusts coming into commercial law, um, a lot of stuff gets tangled up. And one of the cases that we had, Chernside and Fay, in 2016, the Supreme Court did a very, very good job of trying to apply equity and untangle the, the difference between what's equitable and what is contract. So you might go into a contract with another person thinking that you have just a commercial relationship, but because you've made promises to the other person and because maybe you've worked together, on a project and you trust each other, you could end up with a fiduciary relationship, which means that you are bound to each other in equity and have them to act fairly to each other. So in Chernside and Faye, you probably remember this one, Julia. I do, yeah. There was a contract or an agreement between two men to buy up an old, it was a brewery in um, was it Dunedin, I think, yeah. And these two men got quite a long way with the discussions with Harvey Norman in Australia, who were going to come in and build a, a huge complex there, like they do. And then one of the men decided that he no longer wanted to be a double act. He wanted to take all the profit for himself. The person who'd been cut out, he knew nothing about it. He, he just thought, oh, well, we, we're doing fine. I don't have to worry. Whereas, in fact, he'd been double-crossed by his so-called business partner and the court stepped in and the transaction had made $2 million and the court said, you've got to give him half. And so the Supreme Court applied equitable principles to a commercial transaction, but they showed very clearly in the case why they were doing it. And it was because of these extra things like promises and trust 
So, and I, I, thought, I thought that was breakthrough. And of course, that was Dame Shana Elias, who has just retired. Um, a brilliant judgment. She, she was a brilliant judge. Sorry to see her go. Yeah, that case is a really memorable case. I think what it tells us is that if you're going to get into business with people, behave honestly and fairly. I mean, that that's yes. the, the heart of it, really, isn't it? Yes, and that that's equity. Yeah. You know, behave to someone as you would want them to behave towards you. Yeah, and, it's really straightforward. And it can override a structure that's been created or something like yes. a contract. Or... It can. It can, or it amends it. It comes along. It comes up alongside, and says, "No, we can strike that out because that's not fair." But leaving in anything that's that's fair, so mm. it left in the bit that said we are going to share the proceeds, but took out the bit that said, "I'm going off on my own to do this." It's definitely one of those cases that that sticks in your mind when you when you go through law school. Well, for me certainly, because some of them, some of the laws, you know, around commercial and they and contracts and things. I mean, while there's a logic, I found that equity was a particular favourite of mine because of that underlying kind of moral treat each other. You know, there was that that clear moral basis for the for the laws mm. in equity, yeah. which is what you kind of go to law school for. Look, you're looking for that. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's it's a basic principle that you think you're going to find. Lots mm. of people are disappointed, <laughs> and they find it's not. It doesn't go all the way through. No. <laughs> go back to something you said, Julia, about lots and lots of people still behaving as though um, a trust is just a commercial transaction. I think we've had so many cases over the past few years where that's been proved not to be so, that people are getting a little bit more wary. We just need to educate the accountants. (laughs) We need to tell them, don't do it. So when would a person, because I've talked to accountants about this, when would, if I was going to the accountant, when would I... Well, what would be the right situation to set up a trust as opposed to, you know, the negative example of hiding stuff? Um, if it was legitimate. Um, like a so family you, trust. Like a family, yeah. Uh, a very big example in New Zealand is where you get divorced. Say you are married to the woman. and We'll, we'll keep it heterosexual because it's easier for me than saying man one, man two, you know. So if you're married to the woman and the woman decides that you're going, she's going off with another man, your children will sometimes be co-parented, but they end up being in a, two different families. And then if that relationship breaks down, there can even be a third layer of relationship. Now, if you die, oh, and you might then go off and have another relationship, and even more children. So if you die, you can sort it out with a will. But while you're still alive, you probably want to set up a trust so that some of your assets are protected and would go, um, would be in trust for your children. So that would protect the assets from anything that your ex-wife might want to do. You might want to set up a family trust for those children as well so you would decide which assets you wanted to set up trust with find someone you trusted as to be trustees usually a personal friend and a solicitor and you would could put the money in their names put the assets in their names and then your children would get all the benefit without any risk of anyone else muscling in so i guess Trusts are meant to be used in situations for personal, mostly for personal protection of the beneficiaries' assets, but it's become more of a how can we use this vehicle for to protect us from any commercial investments that go sour when, as you say, Sue, the company law is really meant to be like the limited liability mm is really meant to be how that is supposed to be protected 
but people have sh- have used them, got that yes. kind of paths mixed with them. It's not always to hide the asset. Sometimes if you're thinking about going into a business, if you put the assets, your personal assets, into the trust first, before you have any idea of how the business is going, whether it's going up or down, then that's very sensible because you don't want creditors to take the house from underneath your wife and children. Right. It's what makes the difference is your attitude. One, you're doing it to protect your wife and children, and the other, you're doing it to protect yourself from really, um, you know, honest creditors. So it's that difference. It's the honesty aspect. So some family trusts to protect from creditors is fine as long as they're set up when the creditors don't exist yet. Mm. So the intention intention is to protect those beneficiaries. If, you, if you're in business, you're getting into trouble, yes. and you're like, oh, I need to protect my assets, let's set up a trust. And, That's not the time, yeah. Right. But if you've done it early... Be considered and, a sham. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that's right, absolutely. So it's, da- again, down to honesty, down to fairness. Yeah, mm. that's why it's such a, a great area of law, I think. So you've mentioned one case that's particularly memorable. Are there any other cases that, or even experiences of people you know that, and obviously you don't have to name them, but it your brain <laughs> where, <laughs> where, yeah, where it's very memorable to you, where this has particularly come into play, whether that's trusts or something to do with the law of equity. The only one I can think about is it's about again my mother in law. She is was was she's passed away now. She was the sole beneficiary of an awful lot of trust of shares that came to her from a great aunt. And her one desire in all of it was to stop my Uh, brother-in-law from getting any of the money from getting his hands on the money so she spent a lot of time coming to me and also going to her solicitor just to check up that what I was telling her was okay Um, (laughs) trust but verify I mean the problem was I taught the blinking solicitor (laughs) but we won't tell her that so she spent a lot of time and effort setting up a family trust so that my husband, myself, our children and my sister-in-law and her child got the money without the brother-in-law having any part of it. Now, that's very difficult because English marriage laws are all very similar to New Zealand. So if they divorced, he would be entitled to sort of 50-50. So it was a very, very tricky trust to establish to avoid, to try to avoid him being entitled to any of the money. So what we did in the end was bypass her and make the trust in favour of her child. Um, And the child had special dispensation to allow her mother some of the benefit, but not her father. Well, that must have hurt the child enormously because she didn't have any beef with her father. She didn't want to, you know, um, she didn't want to give favour to her mother, but this was the way the trust was set up. I mean, luckily, she kind of liked me, and I think I was quite useful sorting all this stuff out, so that didn't didn't apply for us. But, yeah, and it still causes family trouble today. Mm. So that's one that does spring to mind. Mm. And I would imagine that's probably quite a common scenario where, you know, a person in the family, specifically you want to not include them in, in you know, your will or whatever. And so mm. how do you go about doing that when they have some challenging rights if you don't do it right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, but it's, I always say to students, all of life, you don't need soap operas because all of life, is in equity and trusts, and especially you mentioned wills. Am I allowed to talk about wills as please, well today, please as do. well as trusts? Please. The do. other thing that struck me as being of enormous importance 
was the New Wills Act in um, 2007. Mm. Section 14 gives the High Court the right, the ability to verify any document as being a will. So if you make notes that you're going to take to your solicitor the next day, you make notes about where you're going to leave all your money and what trust you're going to set up, all that sort of thing. Just make notes. And then you die overnight. Somebody can take those notes to a solicitor, to a solicitor go to the high court, and that can be taken as your will, even if the notes weren't you know, conclusive or mm. they weren't um, signed, anything, as long as they're, they're in your writing. I, I guess that would be easier to kind of pass by a judge if there was no will in existence before those notes were made. So you'd then have to establish that the notes mm. were the new intention that override yeah. the previous intentions. But a lot of judges don't seem to have any difficulty doing that. Right. Um, they they are, no, no, this this is what she said, this it's is what current. she wants now. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, suicide notes have been accepted. Wow. Um, letters, yeah, letters to people in different envelopes have been squashed together and they've been accepted as, what about as the will. Yes. Now, this is the big thing. We've only had one case so far, and it was accepted because the person who was named as beneficiary in the email um, was also the what we call um, residuary legatee. That means he would have got the money anyway. Mm. Yeah. He, he would have got what was being given to him in the email. He would have got anyway had there been no will. So, but that's the big problem. I mean, I think that's putting the, the toe of the boot in and we, we are going to see more and more like that. But anyone can send an email. How can you prove who sent the email? It's ridiculous. Um, but it, it's, gone, it's gone quite a long way and I think maybe we need to pull that back a bit. Yeah. But yes. I guess yeah. you'd have to go into the IP address to verify where it came from. It could get quite technical. Yeah, and... and take fingerprints of the the keyboard <laughs> to see whose little fingers were you know all the ever popular dna like they do on csi yeah <laughs> which looks totally legit um yeah. <laughs> not far-fetched at all <laughs> oh no, no i need instant <laughs> oh dear so if it's will stuff like average new zealander why why bother? Don't the kids just get it? Or my wife will get it if I die? Well, you might want to cut people out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was, that child. Or yeah. have specific <laughs> things go to specific people. Yeah, like, you know, if, if one true. child's particularly musical and you have something, like for our fun, fun our family, um, my my popper had played the double bass and he's actually got a strat had a stradivarius which is a very valuable double bass mm. and so that got passed down to my father because he was the main musician in the family and so then you know obviously that will be passed down to whomever is the most musical so so that that's the kind of thing that you want to have in your will I guess that's true that's true and in our family it's who gets the boat who gets the big car, you know, one of the grandchildren going <laughs> to get my ticket little items. runabout car. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, the, the best thing is to give it away to them before before you snuff it. We've started doing that with a lot of stuff. Um, but I remember there was one case which was memorable for a couple of things. Um, a, a mother uh, mother and grandmother, the, the eldest lady in a family, she cut all of her fano out of her will, except for one daughter who she trusted. She didn't trust the rest. And um, so it was essential that she made a will and made it very clear. And she wrote in the will why she didn't want anyone else to have the farm. So that's very important. You know, you have reasons to prevent the will from being challenged. You write those reasons in. Yeah. So it, it's not, not always 
not always the best thing to just assume that you children will get it. I actually really want to get into wills but I feel like that's we might get you back for another okay. discussion <laughs> because there's so much that yeah. that we could ask and talk about wills. What what do you think Sue is the most important issue that's facing facing the public at the moment and getting access to justice and it and it may be that it because it's one of the founding principles right is is having access to justice for all through through any legal system. So what are your views on whether it's it's better or whether it's changed or what you know what what's your view on on the most important kind of issue that's that's facing that at the moment? Well, I think for a long time the law people who administer the law, people involved in the law have got further and further away from ordinary society. If you are going to a solicitor these days, even what I would call your high street solicitor, you feel like you've got your best, put your best bib and tucker on. Um, you know, my husband says, oh, look, I've trodden on the carpet. That's 10 bucks. Um, <laughs> you, know, you go in, oh, look, someone's got to clean that glass screen. That's another 10 bucks I'm paying. You know, it's all very... Um, it's all very removed from everyday life. That, to my mind, is is one of the biggest problems. I think politicians as well, you know, the lawmakers mm. are a part of that wholeheartedly. And you look at the way some of the legislation's drafted, and I know they've tried to improve it, but some of the legislation, it's it does take... Even, getting, even lawyers getting their heads around the way it's been drafted... Yeah, yeah. And it's that's been a problem since the 13th century. You know, writers, they were first of all paid by the word. So they're going to make <laughs> it a little bit, you know, wordy, aren't they? You're absolutely right. And the whole thing, look at the way the new land law legislation has been written. You know, I'm still answering queries about that from, from people. Yeah. And yet that was meant to be an improvement on the previous yeah, yeah. Who who knew? Why would you need but, a lawyer though if you could understand it? Well, and that and that <laughs> yeah. answers some of some of why it is written that way. Mm. Yes, that's shocking. There is an element of credibility that comes with that stiffness, and mm. that you know the pompous side of the law allows that people to think, well, they must know what they're talking about. <laughs> Look at the flash office and yeah. flash car. I better listen. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, I've got an anecdote about that. A friend of mine uh, qualified at the same time as me, but he went on to be a very, very successful solicitor, still is. Um, but when he first started, he was very hesitant about anything to do with trust. So by that time, I was in I was working at a university in England and he would say to his client, excuse me a moment, I'm going to confer with one of my senior partners. And he'd ring me up and say, Sue, help. <laughs> and he would come in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maintaining the mystique. <laughs> Whereas in actual fact, he was ringing up his friend. <laughs> well, you're a little bit more than a friend. You're a pretty educated legal. But he was supposed to be it. He was supposed <laughs> to be the one that knew everything. Well, I, I did have one associate say to me one day, you know, we're in the business as lawyers of being right. We're in the business yeah. of being right. We can't be, we can't take the risk of being wrong. And I've pondered on that for a really long time because that's a really scary thought. And you can it see is. why lawyers are, you know, highly stressed, highly strung, mm. um, because to be right all the time is a massive ask. It's, a, it's an unrealistic ask. Oh, and you give the wrong advice, and of course you're going to be sued, and your firm is going to be sued, you know. It is quite a big ask. So I guess that's, and that is partly why you stepped on the carpet and it's $10. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. There's two sides to it. Kind of leads me into the most commonly asked questions that you get from non-legal friends. What's the trust for? Should I have one? Because lots of people are thinking they always they always need one. Do you tell them? 
I ask them what their personal situation is. And if they're on the brink of, say, leaving employment and going solo, then I say, yes, you should have one because you don't know what the future holds and you should protect yourself. But if they are in a position where they've been trading for a while, but things are getting bad, then I generally say, no, it's not worth it because you're just giving yourself a shed load of problems. Um, you know, like there's a local gardener who was doing fine um, until we had this huge dry spell and his work has just about dried up and he's living sort of hand to mouth with this franchise. And he said to me, should I get myself a trust? And I said, well, it's, it's a bit late. It's too late. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's quite sad. And they they don't want to know that. Mm. They want to think it's a magic bullet. So it's circumstance dependent on whether or not yes. you need a trust. So, so then the advice is do it early and in advance before you're into any of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as long as you've got a valid reason for having one. I mean, there's no point having it if you're just, just going to make life difficult for yourself because you lose control over your asset. Well, you should <laughs> if you're doing it right. Just to be clear, the settler, they no longer have control over those assets and that's where the confusion comes in where the settler will just think well I'll just put it into a trust and then I'll just carry on acting as though that somebody else is supposed to be appointed but the trustees then then become yes see what they do very often is they appoint trustees who are like employees yeah so they say to an employee okay you're going to be my trustee now but if you don't do what I tell you to you've got the sack and so the employee becomes just like a yes man And you've got a solicitor who's like your brother-in-law who doesn't want to make any waves in the family. And so he's another yes man. And so your settler is then dealing with the property just as he wants. And the courts will just strike that out. Mm, Again, that can be seen as a sham. Yeah. So it does come back to your behaviour and your intention. Mm. Guilty of fraud. Yeah. Do you have any other tips that you have for listeners, Sue, that it doesn't have to be legal? We do this, we ask everyone this. Well, first tip, always be good to your mum. Yeah. Second tip, <laughs> always read everything you sign. You must have a story associated, or stories, plural. No, when we built this house, we built it from scratch. So we had contracts with architects, builders, project managers, quantity surveyors. And all of these people said to me, you're the only one that's ever read this contract or this bit of paper that I've asked you to sign. And so I, I spent ages reading stuff, amending, crossing bits out, you know. So, yes, it's absolutely true. So first tip then, always be good to your mum. Yeah, yeah. They're both <laughs> great tips. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sue. That's it's been a really interesting topic today that I think a lot of, a lot of lawyers, um, non-legal people, and possibly lawyers have picked up a few accountants. tips. And, and accountants, for sure. And accountants, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, accountants. <laughs> Giving you a hard time. Yeah. Well, you know, accountants are great with numbers, aren't they? Let's... They are. So good with trust. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for today's podcast. And thanks again to our guests, Sue Tappenden, and my co-host, Josh Brown. And thank you to our listeners And a special thanks to Joe, who's helping us produce the show today. And tune in next time when we have another great lawyer on the show. Until then, I'm Julia Stenson. And from all of us here at NZ Free Law, take care and have an awesome day. Kia pai tōra. Check this.